My first reference today is found in Revelation 12, 7 to 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. <clears throat> The question arises, why did God allow the war in heaven? We must remember that before this war, there was peace and security. And we've been told that in the hereafter, there'll be no prisons Even Isaiah 65 talks about some things that will be taking place. And have, for instance, lions will eat straw like an ox. <laughs> but this crisis of distrust, we call it sin. It's a breakdown of trust. Moved by jealousy, the light bearer, Lucifer, he started to undermine trust in God. He became the bearer of lies. He became the adversary. And he did this in pretentiously pious manner. But with his pious manner, he said that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. So who's telling the truth? Well, let's look at Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? which did weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like the Most High. The issue was worship, not power. And so we go to Matthew 4, verses 8 to 11. And the devil, and this is the temptations of Christ. Now, can you imagine now, Satan, who is a created being, coming to Christ. Again, the devil taketh him up, and this is the temptations of Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. The devil taketh him up unto a high, exceeding high mountain, and show him all, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things I will give thee, if thou wilt fall down, and what? Worship me. <clears throat> then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. <clears throat> Can you visualize what the situation was? Christ had been in the wilderness for 40 days without eating. And the devil came to tempt him. It's insanity to think that this creature asked the creator to worship him. And the faithful angels watched this whole scenario. And when Christ said, get the hints, the angels of God came and fed him. <coughs> Gave him food. Now let's take a look at Genesis 3, 1 to 5. <clears throat> How did this whole thing begin? And the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And you might substitute for subtle, cunning, crafty. And this is back when Eve, and he said unto the woman, Eve, yea, as God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it. Now, I don't know where she got that from, but it's not in the scripture that God said, neither shall ye touch it. Neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Don't you want to be godlike? And so the accusations against God's character actually began in the Garden of Eden. God bore patiently until one third of the angels believed that God was not worthy of their trust. Everyone in the universe is caught up in this war. 
Everything depends on the solution of this conflict of distrust. It's bigger than just you and me. The way God worked to win you and me is what has led the universe to believe God is telling the truth. The war was won 2,000 years ago on the cross. You know, I, I have trouble comprehending the universe. Our solar system is in what we call the Milky Way galaxy with 100, 200 billion stars in it. And that's just one of what they call the local group of galaxies, 30 of them. And just recently they discovered what they thought was a dim distant star was another galaxy 200 billion light years away. Can you grasp all that? The early Christians needed encouragement. Christ's coming has been delayed. Heresy is rampant. And even Paul spoke about it. The Docetists in Paul's day were teaching heresy. Christ didn't really come in person. It was all fake. It was all an illusion. And then there was the opposition and persecution. What good news was there? God could be counted on to encourage and enlighten the discouraged early Christians. To look a little higher, a controversy over God's character. Good news is that he has won the war and we should join in the celebration. Why the delay? He's waiting until his children understand the issues of the war. And we tend to focus on what God has done for me. But the issues are bigger than that. The conflict was over the character of God and the false accusations about his character. And that involves the whole universe. How many people are there out there in other planets, in other worlds? We have no idea. It's not been revealed. But we do know from reading the Spirit of Prophecy that there are other inhabited worlds who've had the tree of knowledge of good and evil in, in their midst and have not done what Eve did. The amazing thing is that God has focused his attention on this one planet. I've used this illustration before. If the Milky Way galaxy were the size of the North American continent, our galaxy, I mean our solar system, would be the size of a teacup. And the amazing thing is God is focused on this planet, this planet in rebellion. And so, what we need to understand is 
that we grow from a limited understanding, a limited personal salvation, to a larger truth about God himself. The issue is not just what, whether we uh, accept or reject the plan of salvation. The issue is bigger than that. It's universe-wide over the character of God. Great reformers did not see it. They were preoccupied with God's provision for you and me. Martin Luther missed the larger view. He didn't put much credence in Hebrews, James, Jude, or Revelation. I believe Martin Luther will be among the redeemed because he lived up to the light that he had. But we in this last generation before the coming of Christ take all 66 books of the Bible. All of its parts relates to the one central theme, the truth about God. The Bible, an inspired record of God's handling of the crises among his children. There are no shortcuts to trust, or the Bible could be briefer. When falsely accused of being untrustworthy, he demonstrated trustworthiness. And Christ died to reestablish peace in his family. And as I read before, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So this trust that we have in Christ also applies to the same trust we have in the Father. Colossians 1.19 For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Verse 20 and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. You get the picture? It's bigger than just you and me and what God has done to save us. It involves the entire universe, inhabited worlds, and the unfallen angels, all of them are involved in this. To be reconciled to God and his character. Now let's look at Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the message of the word involves heaven, everybody there, all the unfallen worlds, and us who are on this planet in rebellion. And this uniting is just the opposite of war. Now let's go to Ephesians 3. I'm having 
trouble here. Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So heaven is involved in this. It's more than just you and me on this planet. The way God has worked through the church is a demonstration of the truth about himself. First Corinthians 4, 9. For I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. The word is theatron. We're a theater. The angels. I remember making a statement in another church a number of years back, <clears throat> that we're on probation. And one of the members of the church <clears throat> rem remonstrated me. I don't like the thought that we're on probation, but we are. God has given us our lifespan and some of us longer than others because it's taking longer to get us where we're supposed to be so that we'll be safe to save. We are, we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels, and that's the unfallen angels, and to men. I would like to refer to this text in John, the 12th chapter. Those of you who know me from a long, long time know that my favorite book is the Gospel of John. John 12, 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now we could substitute the word everyone where it says all men. Christ died for the angels too. It's much more than a legal a payment of a legal penalty. It's a demonstration to the universe that what Satan started, he was Lucifer at the time, in a sanctimonious manner, started undermining and saying false things about the character of God. Now, I've got some questions here that I would like you to think about what kind of God do you worship? We tend to become like the God we worship and admire. 
if God, and these, these are questions that you hear from people, non-converted people, if God is a God of love, why did he drown all but eight in the flood? I'm not going to answer all these, but I'm going to throw them out for you to think about. Why did he kill Nadab and Abihu? Why did he kill Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Why did he kill 185,000 Assyrians? Found in 1 Kings 19. Why did he kill Ananias and Sapphira on the church floor? Why did he kill the firstborn in Egypt? Why did he destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did he kill Lot's wife? Why did he kill Uzzah for just touching the ark? <clears throat> This question is killing those who oppose you the loving thing to do. Another question. Is the God who thundered on Sinai the same God who held children in his lap? Think about it. How will you feel when your enemies are destroyed? They got what they deserved. This question. If the prime time rapist was your next door neighbor in the new earth, what would you want to know about him? That he was forgiven or that he was changed? What is the second death? Burning by fire? Staying forever dead? Has anyone died the second death? Huh? Christ died the second death. How was the Father involved? Let him go. Didn't lay a hand on him. Does God say, <clears throat> love me or I'll kill you? This question, can love be forced? Make you love me. Why did Christ have to die? To, let up a, uh, to set up a legal system of checks and balances to give us a good legal standing with God? Or to say something to the universe about God's character? What will prevent sin from rising again in heaven? Fear of punishment? Fear of fire, fire insurance. Is eternal life for those only who are forgiven? Or for them who let God heal the damage done? It's called the rebirth in my favorite book, John, the third chapter. What will it be like to stand in the presence of God and realize that he knows everything about us? Even if we're saved, will we be comfortable to spend eternity with someone who knows us so well? Will God haunt us with our sinful past? Our, our answers depend on what kind of person we believe God to be.
What is the meaning of the cross? In the great controversy setting, the conflict over God's character and government, the gospel takes on a larger meaning. It ends the war. It confirms the loyalty of the universe. God is not the kind of person Satan is accused him to be. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Is it important to have a clear understanding of the character and attributes of God? I believe it is. This quote from Prophets and Kings, 177. I think this is a significant quote. I've got several Spirit of Prophecy quotes here I'm going to share with you, but this particular one from Prophets and Kings. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes. Remember the list of things? Why did God do this and this and this and this? Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Now, if you've studied into the Baal worship, you'll find that all of them hark back to sun god. Doesn't matter which, what name it goes by, it was sun worship, which came into the Christian church in AD 321. I'd like to share with you several quotes here from, from the Spirit of Prophecy. Christ Object Lessons 210. Self-righteousness not only leads men to misrepresent God, but makes them cold-hearted and critical toward their brethren. Does that step on anybody's toes? The elder son, in his selfishness and jealousy, stood ready to watch his brother, who came home penitent, to criticize every action and to accuse him for the least deficiency. He would detect every mistake and make the most of every wrong act. Thus he would seek to justify his own unforgiving spirit. This one from Signs of the Times in 1890. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. I thought he came to save us. Now it's bigger than that, folks. To correctly represent the Father before the fallen children of the earth. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. <clears throat> when the object of his mission was attained, that is, the revelation of God to the world, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. What's it say in John? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This one from volume five of the Testimonies. From the beginning, it has been Satan's studied plan to cause men to forget God that he might secure them to himself. Hence he has sought to misrepresent the character of God to lead men to cherish a false conception of him. The creator has been presented to their minds as clothed 
with the attributes of the prince of evil himself as arbitrary, severe, unforgiving, that he might be feared and shunned and even hated by men. And this one from Review and Herald, 1892. The reason why it seems so difficult to win souls for Christ is that Satan is continually engaged in misrepresenting the character of God to the human mind. Christ came to reveal the Father to the world in his true character, that the false conceptions which men entertained of the divine character might be swept away. One more from volume four, Testimonies. The heart preoccupied with the word of God is fortified against Satan. Get that? If we are preoccupied with the word of God, in other words, that's our primary focus, the word of God, not who won the football game, or you could list a whole bunch of stuff out there that Satan has put in to the world to distract us from what we should be focusing on, particularly in this last day. The heart preoccupied with the word of God is fortified against Satan. Those who make Christ their daily companion and familiar friend will feel that the powers of an unseen world are all around them. And by looking unto Jesus, they will become assimilated to his image. That means reflecting his character, doesn't it? By beholding, they become changed to the divine pattern. Their character is softened, refined, and ennobled for the heavenly kingdom. So what are we facing today? Well, we look around. We see all kinds of things happening. Sickness. In fact, I'm here today because the one who was scheduled to speak has been diagnosed with COVID. But as we approach the very end of time, if our focus is on Jesus Christ, if our focus is on reflecting his character, never mind what's going on out there, then he can work in us the transformation of character that he so desires. Are you willing to commit yourself to focusing on Christ, his character, and on the Father? Would you like to pledge with me? How many would like to do that? Amen.